may be first invite acting secretary for financial service services and the treasury is julia Lam, to give her comments good afternoon uh, i'm very delighted to share with you my uh, response and comments on the um, on the release of this report uh, i'm sure professor casey chen would love to be here but the last minute he was, he was asked to go on a government mission and so that leaves, leaves me with, um, with, uh, with, with this pleasure of, um, uh, and, and this is, uh, as I have read over the report and I've seen um, the, the key recommendations, I do find that it's very well researched and by very, five very fine institution. Paula has provided a very good snapshot of where these four financial centers are. And, 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 uh, and also provided some good recommendations on the way forward. I, I will not be speaking for other financial centers, but as the policy officials who have been closely related uh, and involved in the strategy for developing Hong Kong's financial market, I hope to offer my own uh, or Hong Kong's perspective in how we cooperate and leverage on each other's comparative advantage as we move forward. Now, of the four financial centers, the dominant role of three of them is to serve the domestic sector. By that, I mean that, that uh, um, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Taipei is more akin to a um, financial center whose main um, purpose is to serve their own hinterlands, like in the case of Tokyo or New York. Only Hong Kong is um, truly an offshore center in the sense of like an international financial center which provides the platform for non-resident like foreign uh, uh, companies with the need to raise funds and also with a platform where international investors, institutional investors actually come here and invest. So in short, Hong Kong is China's most international and most open uh, international uh, financial center and this is our clear comparative advantage. Um, in which we should, Hong Kong, from Hong Kong perspective, make good use of as we, um, uh, as we serve mainland's purposes. Now, I, I actually come from the same premise as Paula is. When Paula started the presentation, she actually put forward what China aims to do. I actually um, set off the same way. Um, China is already the second largest economy in the world, but um, the, its domestic currency, its financial markets, its domestic price discovery process are not integrated with the rest of the world. And it's much smaller. It's not um, its influence uh, in the international finance is not commensurate with its economic strength. And it's not integrated in, in, into the rest of the world. So as Shanghai set its sights, it's very clear in a more recent announcement and also very clear in the um, 2009 announcement that it's going to be the domestic, um, the, uh, it, it's going to set the domestic prices for, inter for China's assets and also to become an international financial center in 2020. Now it set its sights to become that um, and it will get there as China lifts its uh, capital account restrictions and move towards full Comfortability. Um, you should uh, actually note when the State Council came out with a statement in April um, 2009 saying that Shanghai would become an international financial center. Um, most people leave out the small print of it. It says it's become an international financial center which commensurates to the international status of the currency. So it can be as international as its currency would be. Now, you have one from Hong Kong's point of view, one has to be very clear what China sets out to do. And clearly, it's our objective to align our development as an IFC to the objectives of China. Our mandate, I mean, based on what I've just said, our mandate and mission is, I would say, one, for, to assist China for RMB to go global, as the internationalization of RMB, and second, to help China's integration, China's financial markets integration with the rest of the world, or in other words, to internationalize China's own financial market. And third, to provide, um, to, to, to 
for Hong Kong to be the financial markets to be a pilot for China's own financial reforms and to provide some benchmark in pricing of its assets, which will provide reference for China as it opens up gradually on its own, in its own pace and on its own term. I would explain a little bit on each of these three um, areas where we can function. First, for RMB to go global, it's very clear now. Um, when China decided to facilitate the use of the currency overseas, uh, it's the so-called internationalizing its currency, there was no um, the capital accounts still very closed. There was no liquidity outside, and there's no uh, and, 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 and there's uh, there's no no way that foreign if there's no way that foreign foreigners can access this cap, capital markets onshore or convert this currency, how do you encourage cross border trade? How do you encourage holding of the currency um, overseas? So clearly, there's a need uh, to have to enable that to happen. There's a need for a degree of convertibility of uh, uh, of RMB offshore. And for that to happen, there is a need for a pool of liquidity to be formed overseas so that within that pool, there is a degree of non-resident convertibility. So that was the idea um, that we put forward and was also debated among um, think tanks and the relevant authorities that for China, from closed capital account to internationalize its currency, there's a need for an offshore women be center. Because unless you open up your doors immediately um, to allow foreigners to access the onshore, otherwise there's a need for this offshore center. So Hong Kong is in the best position to facilitate this because at that time we already had a small pool of liquidity. We have a clearing platform and we, most of all, we have a familiar market legal environment which allow anybody who would like to take the currency risk to separate the currency risk from the country risk. Now, if you take a snapshot of where we are today um, from two years ago when the policy was expanded, we actually did quite well in terms of facilitating this goal. In just two years, um, 8% of China's total trade uh, was, is now denominated in renminbi, and 80% of that is, more than 80% of that is done through banks in Hong Kong. And also in a few months time when, um, when the, I remember the rules for renminbi denom to denominate foreign direct investment was only announced in October last year. In the first quarter figure, for, uh, first quarter of this year, already 25% of FDI it was denominated in renminbi. That's an amazing figure. Our Denson bond market, as Paula has has talked about, the new issuance of last year, that's about 100 billion yuan last year, was already larger than the Hong Kong dollar new issuance, or the Singapore dollar, or the Malaysian dollar. So, and, and from ground zero, we have a very lively CNH market, where, which offers true convertibility um, with 2.5 to 3 billion US dollar turnover a day. And Hong Kong handles, currently handles 80% of global RMB payments. So we have by far already helped um, China achieve its goal. So that's the first objective for, um, and we will continue to go on uh, for RMB to go global. For the second objective, um, how are we going to help China's main and exchanges or the financial markets to be more integrated to the rest of the world. Now, if you, if you think about it, um, in terms of market cap, in terms of, I mean, Paula showed you the, um, the ranking of these, um, uh, of these uh, stock market. In terms of market cap, in terms of the turnover of the commodities market, uh, China's exchanges are actually among the largest in the world. But then, because of the closed capital accounts, um, and, and the prices of commodities or the equities on the mainland are actually not entirely aligned to the, uh, uh, the, the international prices. Uh, now, going forward, it, China being the, one of the largest importers and exporters and users of commodities, so it's, 
it's important that um, that's what the Chinese always themselves called that they would have this pricing power or things uh, China. and which means that in more economics economist terms it's, it's like their their price discovery process that supply and demand on the mainland should play a role and should have an impact on the international um, price discovery process and that's what I I, I, I would I would call it an integrated, more integrated process with the rest of pricing in the rest of the world. So there is certainly a role that Hong Kong um, should play or, or is playing in channeling international liquidity and internationalizing in helping internationalizing their uh, domestic prices. Now, I um, there are things that we, that are happening not not to that extent. Um, like for example, we already have cross listings of products on um, on each other, or we're working on cross listings of products on each other's exchanges. Um, by that I mean, um, for example, we're working on the um, in Shanghai and Shenzhen to be to have the ETFs which tracks the Hong Kong stock. Now, because the ETFs is a, there's a creation redemption process, <coughs> the basket itself should equalize the prices overseas. Uh, in Hong Kong, and also um, through our QV, uh, in the in the next in the next phase, there would be um, ETFs listed in Hong Kong which track the ACS. So again, uh, this is a process in which will help um, help equalize the prices there. And in in, in fact, um, a word on Taiwan: we actually, after signing the MOU with uh, with the securities authorities in Taiwan. There are um, TDFs list. Uh, there are Hong Kong stocks which list on the Taipei Stock Exchange as TDFs. There are also cross listing of the Hong Kong um, ETFs on the on the Taiwan Stock Exchange. Um, as a another in step in the direction of integration or internationalizing, is that um, last August the Stock Exchange announced a three-way joint venture with the Shanghai and the, um, and the Shenzhen Stock Exchange to explore the development of indexes um, and the equity derivative products. So this is another way in which we would tie up with uh, the mainland exchanges and, and in developing um, to become for, and assist with their internationalization. The third area which I uh, would uh, talk about is how Hong Kong markets has served as a pilot for financial reform and providing very important references for, um, for the mainland. Um, I was um, struck by, uh, by a statement made by uh, Premier Wen Jiabao at his um, press conference in March at the close of the um, National People's Congress. Um, in response to a question, he was saying that um, he was monitoring uh, the uh, NDF renminbi rates in Hong Kong. Um, and show that it's seen that it's moving in both directions, indicating that the renminbi levels has achieved, the, the exchange rate level has achieved more or less equilibrium. So um, clearly they've been uh, monitoring the rates and shortly afterwards, PDOC actually embarked on the re uh, refining the exchange rate regime by widening the band um, uh, on the exchange rate, the swap rates level so that market forces can determine, play a bigger role in determining the level of exchange rates. So this is um, an illustration that uh, Hong Kong as an offshore center could provide some sort of benchmark to the um, international value of uh, the renminbi related assets. And it provides important references as, and for the Chinese to consider when and how to open up their account. I would take another example um, which had that in fact too. Now as we all know the A shares and X shares are the same companies and they're listed in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Um, as tracked by the AH um, share price premium index and we all, all, all notice that during stretches of strong rallies in the, um, in the Shanghai A share market, the A shares could be trading at a premium of between 50 to 100% over the H shares. But at a time of, of corrections and consolidations, as in the current case right now, AH shares actually pretty much converge. 
suggesting that the H shares actually provide the bottom to the A shares because it, the H shares is the international valuation of the of the company. It's it's um, in, um, it, it actually uh, pretty much um, traded. I mean, because they've never really have very steep discounts. But what what you you usually see is that they would converge, um, suggesting that this is kind of references for the um, for the onshore. Now to conclude, Hong Kong's International Financial Center has actually thrived by skillfully positioning ourselves as an offshore center and as a testing ground for reform. Our developments needs to be aligned with the objectives of the mainland and take advantage of that. And our tra trajectory of developments is dependent on the comparative advantage of these centers. And our future developments are also dependent on the pace of capital accounts opening. That, that um, ends on my remark. Thank you.